Um, so I'm Evan Powell. I'm, I'm a CEO of Maya Data, which is the company currently behind OpenEBS. Thanks for joining the Hangout. What we're going to try to do is pretty quickly, uh, as in uh, in just a few minutes, uh, do the basics and uh, so that we can get into a little bit more deep technical conversation about use cases and, and, and what we're planning to build in OpenEBS 0.6, as you can see. So uh, there will be demos. So uh, cross your fingers. Hopefully the demo gods are in our favor here uh, this morning or this evening, as the case may be, since uh, I think in Uma's time zone, it is, uh, what time is it? It's midnight. It's after midnight. Uh, so anyway, so thanks for joining. Uh, just a couple minutes on intro, and then we will dive into demos and a uh, and a deeper discussion about how we're building, what we're building. And, and hopefully throughout this, I think everyone will feel uh, comfortable giving feedback, asking questions, uh, but also obviously feel free to hit us up anytime on Slack or any other way that you can find us. So with that, maybe uh, what the heck is Maya Online? We just wanted to start by talking about this free uh, SaaS solution that we soft launched. Uh, so-called soft launched at KubeCon. And uh, I'll give you just some background info on it. What it's intended to do is to give you, as an open EBS user, visibility into your stateful workloads and into open EBS. And we do that using uh, Prometheus uh, underneath uh, and some Grafana. Maya also gives you uh, some chat ops controls. Um, and uh, we're going to demo uh, its ability to really orchestrate cross-cloud data mobility for stateful workloads as well. So Maya is earlier than OpenEBS. As a reminder, we're about a year into the uh, open sourcing of OpenEBS. It was early this year, uh, 2017, that OpenEBS was open sourced. Open sourced by a team, by the way, some of whom are on the call, who have been doing containerized storage for years, but they were doing it on Open uh, BSD. We were doing it. I joined at the beginning of the year as well. So they did a lot of work uh, before I got involved. Um, and again, with Open EBS, we decided, hey, let's containerize storage for containers, meaning put the controller next to the workload uh, in a more modern uh, approach with open source Docker Kubernetes. Uh, that's the quick intro. You probably already knew a lot about that or you wouldn't be here. Um, just a little bit more about Maya Online. This is kind of giving you, uh, I guess, visibility into where it runs. And you can see the little mule, uh, the mule ears running there in your pod uh, as well. So um, there's a lot more that we can do here. And we're really looking for feedback again. Um, to give you an idea, we have three main engineering teams. One dedicated really to Maya uh, in Maya Online. There is a uh, open source uh, on-prem uh, Maya as well that people grab. One dedicated to our storage engine. That we're going to talk a good amount of, about. And one dedicated effectively to everything else, which is Open EBS and all the pieces around the storage engine, the contributions to Kubernetes itself uh, that we've made and so forth. And we'll, we'll talk about that. So there's. There's three high-performing experienced teams attacking these three related sets of technology. Um, you just did the pseudo demo. <laughs> I think uh, we'll do a real demo here in a second. Um, that's kind of what, what I've got, and I'll hand it over to, to Uma, my uh, partner in crime here, to actually do a real uh, quick demo. And then, again, we'll dive into how we're building it and what you would all like to see in 0.6 and so forth. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Evan. Uh, that was awesome. Uh, what I'm going to do right now is uh, just going to show a quick um, you know, preview into what Maya Online is. And then uh, I'll, I'll probably talk about a recap of what OpenEBS is and then do a couple of release updates. Then we'll hand it over to Jeffrey, our CTO, to talk about our new um, storage engine. Uh, with that, um, as, as Evan said, uh, Maya Online is uh, a SaaS platform uh, to connect all the OpenEBS installations, OpenEBS users, K2 
can uh, link their OpenEBS Kubernetes clusters uh, to my online. Uh, currently, it's an invite-only um, platform for uh, a little uh, shorter time. You can log in using GitHub credentials. Uh, I have user here. Let me log in. So uh, first of all, Maya Online is a SaaS platform not to configure Kubernetes itself. Uh, it is a cross-cloud config plane for OpenEBS uh, installations management. Right? Um, we have the notion of uh, organization. A user will, at the moment, uh, a user logs in uh, into Maya Online. You will have a concept of organization and um, you can install uh, import your uh, clusters from various clouds wherever they are running into my online and uh, you can actually import uh, pretty simply by doing a kubectl command um, and you can if you just have a kubernetes cluster and uh, you can uh, my online can actually install open ebs and then import or if you have one already installed with OpenEBS, an existing OpenEBS cluster you can install. And uh, as Evan uh, introduced, um, you have the ability to, uh, user will get the ability to get centralized visibility of all the OpenEBS clusters across, uh, across the cloud platforms, where the Kubernetes installations could be. And uh, you would get uh, a centralized Prometheus monitoring, centralized analytics, uh, chat ops and alerts. Uh, let me show you a couple of things here. Uh, probably let me show the chat apps first. Uh, just like what I have uh, shown here, you can see some alerts that are already coming. Um, user actually can query the configuration uh, and status of uh, um, their own open EBS installations right from the chat apps windows. Uh, for example, here you can uh, see what are the organizations that I'm maintaining at uh, my online and uh, what are the clusters it has, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, alerts will be uh, pretty useful uh, and very granular alerts, which I'm going to demonstrate quickly here. And let me go here and show you one of the Open EBS uh, cluster. So here I'm running a Kubernetes cluster uh, on it. I uh, have a stateful application, Kerkona, and uh, it has uh, some OpenEBS uh, storage attached to it. And OpenEBS primarily runs an API server called Maya API server. And um, it comes with a Prometheus uh, 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 instance and a Grafana um, instance as well as uh, uh, an actual storage provisioner. And as you can see, uh, a storage volume attached to Percona actually comes with uh, two separate containers. That's why we call uh, OpenEBS as containerized storage for containers. And uh, I have a controller, storage controller, um, and the storage replica. You can um, uh, configure through a policy how many replicas a user wants. And um, you actually see uh, there are two uh, instances here in the pod. Uh, one is the sidecar, which is exporting the volume metrics into the Prometheus. And the Prometheus metrics again are pushed uh, into my online. And uh, what I'm going to do here is actually uh, run some um, bench test uh, uh, to put some load on Percona and show you uh, a very granular metrics that, that are visible and then an alert getting generated right here into your uh, uh, chat window. Um, let me see if I'm uh, running any more jobs. Um, bench test on my uh, window. And actually, um, I should be seeing the analytics uh, on the cloud for this volume. Uh, 
let me see in the last five minutes refresh it every five seconds as you can see uh, i'm running it in one cloud where my open ebs is running and the analytics are uh, online uh, in in uh, in my online and uh, the granularity of uh, analytics is such that you can see the latency the read write latency here i'm pumping some uh, load so i'm actually seeing uh, a write latency and uh, because the latency is a bit high i set a rule where if the latency is more than three milliseconds in main alert so uh, i should be uh, getting some alerts uh, right here into this channel and um, um the alerts like this will will keep coming that's that's a quick demo of what maya online can do for you chat apps as well as centralized uh, monitoring metrics uh, and now if there are any questions here on um maya online i can take uh while we are here All right, uh, let me run that uh, as is for some more time. And uh, now I go back to uh, introducing uh, what OpenEBS is uh, for some of the users who joined uh, the first time uh, here. So, so what OpenEBS is, is a container storage for controllers, uh, uh, storage for containers, um, the applications which are stateful in nature, running on Kubernetes, uh, get the right storage solutions through OpenEBS. The main difference with OpenEBS, as far as a, a DevOps a developer is concerned, is uh, a, a developer is going to get a dedicated storage controller uh, whenever a volume is provisioned for the application, as opposed to a shared storage controller that is serving the storage for hundreds or uh, thousands of uh, applications. And it uh, uh, currently uh, integrates nicely into Kubernetes for provisioning. And uh, you don't need to have any special way of provisioning the regular PV PVC model using storage classes. Uh, you can continue to provision storage through OpenEBS for your stateful applications. And uh, it actually fits nicely into the Kubernetes architecture where your storage is um, going to be sitting nicely into the application pod uh, as a container. And um, uh, the OpenEBS Maya, uh, which runs as an orchestration piece in, in your cluster, is going to actually use uh, Kubernetes for scheduling and uh, managing various functionalities uh, with respect to the storage itself such as snapshotting, cloning, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, uh, that's, that's how the architecture of OpenEBS looks like here. And um, so how, do we, how does a new user get started with OpenEBS? It's, it's pretty simple. Uh, we have written uh, 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 the standard uh, Kubernetes operator to install all the components of um, OpenEBS. So once you apply this operator, uh, it installs some storage classes, provisioner, and associated components. It also starts Prometheus Grafana on your Kubernetes cluster. The next step for the user would be to pick the right storage class uh, that's applicable for a given application and, uh, and modify it for various storage policies, such as the capacity, whether you want monitoring or not, what's the storage underneath, and then launch the application using the standard YAML file. So once uh, that's launched, the persistent volumes are going to be created uh, by the open EBS provisioner, and then uh, a volume is going to run as a pod in your application. For example, in this case, you will see that there's a controller and there are two replicas running for your application uh, for now, right? Uh, just to recap, <coughs> The stateful application will get a volume, uh, a persistent volume, as a controller and a replica. These controllers and replica are themselves containers, and that's that gives you a super granularity uh, either to manage the storage policies or to actually move them from one 
um, the stateful data to be moved from one cluster to another cluster. That's what we're going to show today about uh, how do you actually move alive uh, uh, the data from one cluster to another cluster across the geographies. Um, so that's a quick introduction about OpenEBS. Are there any questions? Uh, yes, I can see um, some questions probably um, Evan can answer. How is Maya data monetizing OpenEBS and Maya online? Uh, today, thanks for asking, Craig. Uh, today we're not monetizing, um, but the, the vision is that Maya online will help us uh, support your open EBS environment uh, or environments as the case may be right across clouds and so that uh, eventually and we're really open to input like um, uh, if you were a customer how would you want to be charged you know what seems most fair uh, and so forth because it's not quite storage which traditionally was capacity 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 um, and uh, so there will be a commercial version later this year, um, um, but we're always going to have a free version of Maya online uh, as well. And, and the difference may, may be as simple as um, the support. Um, so yeah, we're very open to that. But basically Maya online gives us the ability to support lots of open EBS instances. And uh, with that, we're going to, to have a commercial license uh, support model uh, in the future launching later i said this year and then 2018 of course not in the next uh, five days or seven days no. input uh, is very you. welcome so thank you uh, thank you craig for asking that question all right uh, let me quickly talk about um, the release updates from openbs uh, first off, thanks to the community. Um, the community is growing, and we had uh, a very um, fruitful October Fest in October um, this quarter. Uh, we had uh, received more than 50 PRs and um, uh, more than 40 new contributors joining the community. We have uh, uh, now close to 100 or like more than 100 contributors um, uh, joining uh, the open BS development. And uh, in KubeCon, a uh, few days before KubeCon, the open EBS release 0 0.5 is made available. We're already seeing some users uh, using it, uh, thanks to all the community members who are using this release and giving a valuable feedback. Um, basically, what we did with the 0 0.5 is um, to enable uh, more storage policies and also to um, as we launched my online you should have um, the capability to pull the metrics uh, from the underlying storage volumes and then um, push them into a centralized uh, 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 centralized platform uh, it's not always that you need to connect to Maya online uh, our storage uh, metrics are uh, available through the local Prometheus and local Grafana. It's just when you need centralized uh, uh, visibility as well as the storage uh, metrics be available for much longer period and then some chat ops uh, options you would need my online otherwise these capabilities are available in the local cluster itself. So one of the things that we did is to run a volume exporter as a sidecar uh, container in the simple storage controller itself. And the initial storage policies that we introduced in 0 or 5, or you can set the number of replicas, you can turn on and off uh, the monitoring. And uh, the significant addition is uh, the ability to start configuring the underlying storage as a policy. Right? So we introduced a concept called storage pool policy, wherein um, you can uh, use the underlying SDKs, uh, the G Cloud or AWS APIs, uh, to consume the underlying disks or the local disk, uh, and then uh, configure them as a disk, and then make it available to Open EBS storage classes. And uh, a more of it will come in the future uh, release or the current uh, active release 0.6. 
Um, but these are the beginning storage policies that we have introduced as a start. And in the meanwhile, um, our team is actively contributing in the storage areas for, uh, for Kubernetes directly. Uh, the recently released 1.8 uh, upstream has um, included the changes that we submitted. Um, uh, the main changes have gone into Kubernetes dashboard itself. Uh, so far, dashboard is mainly used for uh, looking at the configuration of the compute, uh, CPU, memory, etc. But uh, there were no options to do the storage, uh, the new volume plugins, uh, the PV, PVC storage class views. Um, OpenEPS team has submitted uh, thanks to the community Kubernetes. Uh, they were accepted and uh, now are available. Um, you can see the the window here. Uh, you can just browse through. Uh, various uh, PV, PVC storage class relationship. You can add annotations. Uh, a developer can do a lot of things uh, to, to get a view of uh, what are the PV, PVC relationships. And the next thing that we have uh, started to contribute in this area is to include the network and disk usage metrics uh, into the Kubernetes dashboard. And uh, very soon I will be submitting a PR and uh, with that, uh, you will have a native support for uh, configuration view of the storage uh, that's attached to a pod, uh, your, your application, as well as uh, the metrics at the Kubernetes native level. Uh, we hope that that will be useful for many Kubernetes users uh, as, as they use um, OpenEBS. If not, also um, uh, it will be generally available for the Kubernetes community. So that's one update. And we are excited to actually uh, announce and be working on uh, many storage policies in 0 0.6, which will probably come out uh, end of January. And uh, one of the things that we uh, are doing actively is to enhance or add support to the Kubernetes storage extensions itself. Um, Kubernetes has added uh, various storage capabilities such as uh, resource policies of persistent volumes, volume resize, snapshot, and uh, the block volume claims. So all this, the support for all these Kubernetes features uh, will be available in 0 0.6. Apart from that, we are adding uh, additional storage uh, um, capabilities in terms of this monitoring alerts. And whatever we introduced as a storage pool policy in 0 0.5, we are refactoring uh, towards uh, a better Kubernetes architecture using CRDs, custom resource definitions. And um, we are also going to support uh, OpenEBS upgrades uh, through kubectl in 0 0.6 and some enhanceability in uh, debugging. And then we are going to actively test into our CA platform uh, for various platforms such as OpenShift, uh, CentOS, and uh, CoreOS, Rancher, et cetera, et cetera. So overall, I think um, we are excited to um, introduce 0 0.6 features, and um, we are looking forward to various uh, uh, feedback in these features, active contributions. Uh, we'll be more than glad to um, you know, welcome any feedback. And uh, as usual, uh, the team is available on Slack, uh, so feel free to jump in and ask questions. Um, so with that, uh, that that's, that's a quick update on the releases. And if there are any questions, we can definitely take and discuss uh, before we, we, we give the control to uh, Jeffrey or CTO, we'll talk about uh, C-Store. Right, uh, let me check if there are some Questions in the chat window. All right, um, Jeffrey. Yes, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes, I can. Okay, so um, so I, I want to uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, C Store and uh, what we're doing there, and initially uh, talk about what we're not uh, doing there. Um, and uh, C-Store is our new data engine um, that we are working on. Um, we believe that OpenEBS should have a pluggable system such that we can swap out data engines as we call them 
um, as we move forward, because what is true today may not be true tomorrow. And with all new technologies bubbling up, you may want to have a different way to persist data uh, on, for example, persistent memory than you would on, on rotational drive. So this, this pluggability um, is important for us, and C-Store is our next um, engine that we're going to add to the Open EBS family. Um, so to start out, um, I want to talk about what C-Store is not, because, you know, it, it is very tempting when you're a storage company, which, you know, we are from, from, from origin, uh, to think about, okay, so let's build another distributed file system, because distributed file systems, they scale in performance, they scale in, in capacity, and the only thing you need to do is just add hardware to the mix where you can run your software on. Um, but C store is not a distributed file system. And the reason for this is that when we sat back and looked at you know, how are cloud native applications being developed today, do we really need one? So from a capacity standpoint, what we see is that you know, the data sets that the containers run on are relatively small. Um, there are gigabytes, um, you know, few might be terabytes, but certainly not petabytes. So, so the, um, the data gravity, to sort of speak, is very, very limited. And, and you know, it kind of fits the microservice model. Um, and the second aspect that obviously is important is performance. So you want to scale performance. But when we look at hardware trends these days, you can have a single NMVE uh, SSD who can achieve 400,000 IOPS. Right, and you can add one or two together, maybe even three, and you know, so you're already over the million IOP. So we, we thought, you know, we don't really need a distributed system to achieve capacity and performance because the model uh, doesn't really fly anymore. So, and the final aspect, obviously, is is the cloud native applications themselves. They are built with scalability in mind. This is achieved typically due to load balancers or what have you, and it fits the model of Kubernetes where you basically scale up and scale down services as you need more nodes. So load distribution and therefore also capacity distribution through sharding and what have you is already done um, at, the, at the application layer itself. So you don't necessarily need to scale performance like we did in the past by adding more drives. Um, now, having that said, this doesn't apply that C-Store cannot handle large volumes of data. In fact, it can do a whole lot of data, uh, 2 to the power of 128. So it is a huge amount and can do microsecond latency. So, so now we set that straight, you know, what C-Store is not. Let's look into the next slide where we'll go over, you know, what C-Store is. So we have a storage background, so we are very familiar with the enterprise class storage features that people in the storage world at least are growing accustomed to in terms like snapshot clones, compression, replication, and all these type of, uh, type of things. And these technologies are a key enabler for what we call a C motion, which we will demo uh, after I'm done with my slides. And we believe that that is a key feature key necessity for cloud to cloud uh, businesses because um, you know, we believe that you, know, you, you want to have the ability to move out of Amazon to Google Compute, from Google Compute to DigitalOcean to whatever um, cloud vendor uh, you might have. And the other thing is, is that data consistency is very important. Um, in particular, when you scale microservices and you have to do a file system check before you can actually mount your persistent volume claim, that's not a good thing because, you know, the whole concept of scaling things rapidly and elastically basically uh, uh, go down the toilet. So transactional uh, I.O. was really important. Um, data integrity and encryption. Um, as you move data across clouds, um, you need to verify that your data is, is, is in fact still what you wrote. So when you have an EBS volume on Amazon, you know, it has certain features, but it doesn't necessarily tell you anything about data integrity. Um, they have encryption available, but that encryption basically is tied to the Amazon encryption methodologies. And you don't necessarily want to uh, unencrypt your data and re-encrypt your data uh, on a different cloud provider. So we think that those things are important as well. Um, online expansion of existing volumes. So if you're um, MongoDB, let's say, needs another, I don't know, SSD uh, for capacity, we need the ability to, to grow that volume seamlessly online without, you know, migrating data from, from machine to machine and, and things like that. Um, and then there are the, um, 
one of the fundamental things that we strongly believe in is the clout native versus clout wash storage systems. Um, you see a lot of storage systems out there that basically uh, put some lipstick on their API. They write a driver for Kubernetes or for something else, and boom, there you go. Uh, they call it you know cloud storage. Uh, we took a really fundamental different approach. We really uh, redesigned everything from the ground up and embracing the paradigms that are used to build these cloud native applications and apply them to storage. So we really reimagined how storage for cloud native apps on prem and in the cloud um, should look like. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we can see a little bit you know, how that looks under the hood. Um, this is a high level overview. So at the top, we have the controller. This is what your application connects to, to sort of speak. Um, today, we have iSCSI. We are looking into ICER, which is accelerated iSCSI with InfiniBand. Uh, we're looking to NNVE over Fabrics as well. And if the community so desires, we can even uh, put file on top of that. Um, but the I.O. comes in at the controller and based on, on the YAML and based on how you want your data to be protected, we forward the I.O.s to the actual replicas. And this is what, what in fact is CStore itself. Um, and based on uh, um, the replica count, we will make sure that all the data is stored transactionally, as I mentioned before, and the data is written in a copy on write fashion. So that means that we never overwrite data. And, and I'll go over a little bit more detail uh, uh, in a bit, uh, but I want to uh, uh, um, wrap your attention a little bit on the, on the red wire. I was about to say green, I don't know why, um, but it's red. Because I want to point out that this, these, these connections, to so to speak, are containerized themselves. And I will explain that in a bit as well. But first, I want to go to the next slide where we talk a little bit about the transactional semantics that are inherent to CStore, which allows us to do things like CMotion. So each write uh, is assigned a transaction. And um, all the transactions are assigned to a transaction group. Now. Um, when we write the transaction groups to the disk, we do this atomically. So what this means is that the whole group succeeds or the whole group fails. There's nothing in between. And this is basically what gives us the, the, the atomic nature of the file system and which gives us the ability to never do a file system check because we always have a certain view of the data based on a transaction group numbers. So if I start with one, I go to the next transaction group, that is two, and only if all the writes in that transaction group have completed, then and only then we will increment the number to two. And the data that has not been acknowledged because the transaction group has failed, to so to speak, um, the application will, will retry because the application has been told, you know, I did not acknowledge your write yet. So you still have to hold on to your own data. Um, and this also gives us the foundation of, of snapshot, snapshot, excuse me, snapshotting uh, in the cloud. Because by comparing these transaction group numbers, we can very quickly find the delta between transaction one and transaction two. And so by scanning these blocks um, uh, between two transactions, we can find the delta that needs to be replicated to the other side, which is the key enabler uh, for CMotion. And I'd like to point out, which is also very important, is that this is all done from user space, right? So there are no kernel dependencies. And this is really important in our mind when we talk from cloud to cloud business, because um, when you deploy on Amazon and you run Ubuntu version XYZ, and you move to, let's say, Google Compute Engine, which runs, I don't know, uh, CoreOS uh, version, whatever, whatever, you will, suffer from kernel difference, kernel differences in terms of versions, but also um, kernel differences in terms of features. <clears throat> so Ubuntu may have integrated something that CoreOS hasn't and vice versa. And you really do not want to maintain your own kernel versions in the cloud as you move your workloads uh, from left to right. The other thing is, is that um, apart from uh, being able to find differences between kernels, you also have to sometimes you may have the problems that you taint your kernel. And by tainting your kernel, you basically load software, which may or may not have a different licensing model compared to, to the native license model of, of, of Linux. And that taints your kernel and, and in fact will, for example, uh, disable certain kernel features like lock debugging. And if you have a problem and uh, you're trying to get support, they might say, well, you know, 
that's not something that we really ship in our kernel. So I don't know uh, what, you know, what your problem is. And basically you're on your own. And the key takeaway here is because we have the atomic updates and the data is always consistent uh, on disk, C store itself becomes stateless, right? So C store does not have state by itself, just what's on the disk. Um, and and this, is a, this is a fundamental aspect. And be, because we are atomic, we can achieve this. So if we go to the um, uh, next slide, um, we will cover a little bit about, okay, so what about performance? Um, and obviously running everything in user space, you know, creates some challenges in performance to begin with. And one of which is obviously the fact that you need to copy data in and out from user to kernel. Um, and besides the copying, the other thing that you need to do is do is, is context switches. And, and, you know, these things with low latency devices really add up. So, so, so we need to find a way uh, to avoid that. That's one. Um, the second thing is that the hardware trends, you know, um, if you look at, you know, a white label box today, one new server can achieve 17 million IOPS. Now, it is very unlikely that I myself will have a box that does 17 million IOPS, but when you are using systems in the cloud, you know, typically Amazon and Google will have the latest and greatest hardware available there for you. And in fact, NMVE is publicly available in, in, in I think, all the clouds uh, already today. So these devices are actually available to, to people who would not normally have those. And so low latency SSDs and 100 gig network, um, that really becomes a problem because the kernel itself becomes a bottleneck as well. And if we look at a 10 gig NIC example here, and we're only sending 64 bytes, which is absolutely nothing, um, the CPU only has a couple of cycles per NIC to process that. Um, and the final piece, obviously, um, is that uh, um, CPU frequency, you know, it, it, it is it's crawling up a little bit. I won't say that it's completely come to a standstill, um, but it's absolutely stagnated over time. Um, and, you know, the way that we uh, keep applying Morse principle is basically add more cores. Um, but by adding more cores, your software actually need to be able to utilize these cores. And that is a, not as easy as it looks. Um, and, you know, if you buy the latest Apple iMac, uh, which is released, I think it starts with 14 cores. Uh, that is an unbelievable amount. And that is just a desktop system, right? And if you look at the cores using Activity Monitor, you will actually see that a lot of the cores are actually idle. And this is because software was not written um, by utilizing these cores. So another aspect that we, we want to point out here that we, what we took in consideration when we designed C-Store is that hardware trends really enforce a change in the way that we do things. So to put a little bit, a little bit in perspective on the next slide, um, there is actually some data um, from Intel um, that shows you that how the Linux kernel scales by adding uh, a, a number of SSDs. And this is being achieved by the uh, SPDK framework uh, from Intel, which they developed. And you can see, the, I mean, the, the picture speaks volumes. I don't even have to explain. By adding more SSDs, by bypassing the kernel, they scale linearly, as you would expect, ideally. Um, the right-hand side picture is something similar, except for networking, a very, very limited web server that sends uh, hello world to the client. Um, the gray bar is a web server in kernel, and the red one is, is uh, in completely in user space. So it really pays off to architecture application um, in user space, but obviously keeping in mind the context switches. Um, so how do we do that? And that is something uh, um, we have in the next slide. So obviously, you know, I already alluded to it a little bit, um, is we need to bypass the kernel. Um, this is, you know, not as easy as it sounds, um, but the way that we are doing it is that we, inst so instead of doing the IO to the kernel using your regular system calls where you do read write to the kernel, we basically enable our containers to send the IO to yet another container, which we call the IO control container or the IOC. And um, this IOC basically has direct access to the hardware that normally would be accessed by your kernel. Um, the way that we do this is we basically map the, the network interface card rings to user space so that we can read the incoming package directly and, and, and compute them in user space so there's no copying involved. And the other thing 
um, for NMVE devices, for example, is to map the PCI bars into user space, and then we can write in the PCI bars and have the I.O. be handled by the hardware directly. And as I mentioned, we have a lot of cores, right, in systems available. So what we can do is we can take a configurable amount of cores and drive them to 100% CPU and basically do nothing else but, hey, is there an I.O.? Hey, is there a network card? So instead of sleeping and having an interrupt-driven model, we have something called pole mode drivers, which constantly um, ask and check for a new I.O. Uh, um, if that has come in. And the final piece here is that we borrowed uh, some technology from, from the virtualization uh, space. So there is a lot of stuff done there to, to improve and, and, and you know, bypass and, and you know, the guest operating systems and what have you. And one of the interfaces that we are reusing is the vHost interface. And then it's a vHost user interface, obviously. And the vHost user interface in Virtio SCSI is basically a protocol. So it has nothing to do with virtualization per se, but it is a protocol where you can communicate between two processes. And in this case, these will be two containers. So to summarize it all in, our, in the last slide, um, what C-Store is, um, so it, it provides all enterprise class features that you know, that you've grown accustomed to from your you know, storage vendor, which, which one ever it is. Um, we provide data integrity features that are missing natively in the Linux kernel. So like uh, uh, checksums and, and, and things like that. Um, we provide the ability, uh, uh, the ability to efficiently work um, with the data using copy on write. So we can do the incremental send and receives of, of, of change blocks over time. We bypass the kernel for IO. Initially, we will, you know, as we develop this, we will be slower than the kernel, but I'm 100% convinced that over time, we will actually outperform the kernel if we would run the same software uh, directly in kernel. And, um, you know, want to point out again, cloud native design. So we are using containers to build this system up. We are not lipsticking an existing storage system by adding an API on top of that and trying to market that. Um, and lastly, which is probably a very important for the DevOps world, is, is that we remove the friction between developers and the storage admins. And with that, you know, I realize that I've, I've, I'm going quickly, but I, I don't want to take up all your time in, in this morning or in the evening. Um, but if there are any questions, uh, feel free to ask them. Um, if you want to take it offline, that is fine. I am just like the rest of the team. I'm available on Slack, uh, but feel free to ask me any questions at this point. Um, thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, yes, there is uh, one question from Craig. I think uh, Evan has already answered in short. The question is, uh, what about the storage um, container residency with uh, the actual uh, compute? Is right. It, uh, Model yes. So, uh, if 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 I interpret the question right, uh, um, basically it, it becomes a, a problem of data locality, right? Um, so, residency: where does the data live? Where does my compute live? So, because we integrate, um, well, I wouldn't say integrate. I think that's the wrong term. Uh, my colleague Kieran uh, uh, worded it better at a certain point. Um, but we are not integrating with Kubernetes. We are building on top of Kubernetes. And so the container workload, so the actual application is running on the same physical machine um, as the storage system. So from a workload perspective, from a container perspective, it is local storage. And when we need to reschedule because of a failover um, and the application gets moved, we move the controller as well. And we obviously have container affinity, which is, I think, was added recently uh, to Kubernetes, uh, where you can say, well, Kubernetes, if you have to reschedule it, you know, please put it on this node, this node, and this node. It, you know, if it really can't work, then fine, put it somewhere else, but ideally put it on this node. I, I hope that answers the question. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Um, so, so you know, why copy on write instead of a pointer-based solution? Um, I think that means solution. Um, so, you know, there, there are different ways to do different things, obviously. Um, we have a storage background where we are working with copy on write type like file systems, and they have proven uh, very useful. 
Um, we did not want to throw away all the storage lessons learned that we had in the past. Instead, we want to bring that and, and bring that into the container space instead of you know, trying something radically different. Now, as I, as I mentioned that uh, in the beginning, OpenEBS is a pluggable system. So you know, if over time, different pointers or, or byte addressable storage becomes more interesting, then we will definitely look at that. Um, but in general, um, building a storage system or a storage on disk format, so to speak, that is very um, subject to you know the the the, the um, cycle of time. So what I mean with that is you do not create a file system on Monday and put it in production on Friday. There is a huge mass of of, of quality assurance that you need to do on top of that because eventually data is your state. These are your crown jewels. You can. You can spin off new compute. You can throw away your compute nodes and replace them with something else physically. You cannot do this with storage. So we do not, at this stage, uh, want to risk uh, something with the technology that you know we we need to develop from the ground up. Um, you know, uh, so it was a conscious choice, and uh, we believe that for right right now it's it's the right choice. Uh, but as mentioned, our uh, I/O engine is pluggable, and we can swap it out with any. IO engine that we that we see fit over time. Uh, the multi-writer access mode. So um, uh, Dan, thank you for your question. So the multi-writer access mode, um, it depends. Right now, no. Well, yes, but you know, it's not a uh, it's not a, a wise thing to do because you would need to make SCSI reservations at the application level, which you definitely do not want to get into. Um, well. I say definitely not. Maybe there are situations you want to, but um, as one of the one of the slides that I depicted originally, uh, we are doing iSCSI, ICER, and NMPA over Fabric. Um, when we and if there is a high demand for multiple access, uh, multiple writer accesses, we need to define a different protocol. And NFS is obviously uh, a low hanging fruit here, but then we would actually need to move to file based protocols here. So um, the block-based protocols in general do not lend themselves for sharing uh, ownership of the line in terms of multiple writers at this point. Okay, thanks, Dan. Another question from Craig. Does the... Um, so uh, yes and no. So um, yes, in the sense that we would like it to, uh, no, in the sense that it's not able to in a degree that we want that. And finally, um, as I pointed out, we are doing IO in user space. So we cannot talk to the kernel and tell Kubernetes, hey, um, grab this slash def SD, whatever, whatever device and, and do whatever you want with it and do your thing with it. So we, we really need to uh, uh, um, write our own abstraction layer to sort of speak on top of that. But we are definitely very much uh, looking into how we can do that completely transparent <clears throat> to the user. Because we, we, we basically follow the Kubernetes model. Um, but it, unfortunately, it is not as simple for us to use the local persistent volume interface right now. Yeah. Uh, Jeffrey, if I may add uh, uh, one more point to Craig's question. Um, uh, with the storage pool policy that was introduced in 0 0.5, it is possible to uh, attach the local storage disk um, in LVM and then uh, attach to the persistent volume claims. Uh, it is possible, but as, a, as Jeffrey said, it may not be the most optimum way. And uh, with C store and a lot of things that Jeff talked about, uh, we will have a much better way to access the local storage. And part of it is also to do with uh, the block volume claim support that's coming in in, in Kubernetes uh, pretty soon. So with that and the C store work, we will have uh, a very neat way of accessing the local storage disk. Yes, and, 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 and I would like to add to that, that you know, uh, as Kubernetes evolves, we are you know, very uh, tightly following the developments there. And, and, but the end goal will be, from a, from a usability standpoint, when you, when you look at your YAML, um, that's what you have to deal with. And your YAML you know, will comply to certain rules and certain 
uh, standards, to sort of speak, from Kubernetes, and we will apply uh, to these uh, standards. So from a user uh, perspective, it's completely transparent. Um, so I, I think the R refers to RAID. Um, I think protected versus not uh, basically implies to the same thing. So, um, so the, the, the cool thing is, is that with our system, uh, we allow several uh, ways to protect your data. So we can obviously, within the IOC container, take ownership of a certain amount of disks that you want us to use. And based on that, we can create local redundancy uh, in any way uh, that you want. So for example, if you want to have a rate six type like configuration uh, over your devices local on the node, um, I call that local redundancy, um, you can do so. Um, you can even have a single disk and then say, I want on this single disk, I want to have three copies of the data. And then we will go out of our way to make sure that from a logical block access uh, address, these numbers will be, you know, apart so that, you know, they're on different platters or on different, you know, cells of, of the NMV devices or what have you. Um, so that's, that's all available from, from a local redundancy standpoint. And then we, uh, on top of that, have the remote redundancy. And that basically allows you to define a number of replicas um, that obviously live in a different rack and, and certainly on a different node. Um, and, um, we are also looking into erasure encoding because that's a little bit more space efficient. Um, but yeah, we so we provide different levels of data redundancy, all configurable through YAML uh, and ideally, you know, by, by configured by storage classes, if, if that makes sense, uh, Craig. Um, thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, Craig, uh, very good questions. Uh, we have still uh, six more minutes. Um, uh, if there's, um, there are more questions, we can definitely take. If not, uh, we'll do a quick demo of this emotion feature. All right, um, let's start with that. Uh, uh, and before I start, I was just uh, about to show that, you know, um, we ran the, the bench test and they stopped. Uh, as you can see, that the, all the stats are real time. And I had seen some alerts coming up saying that the capacity uh, was more than a certain um, percentage. And also the uh, write latency was pretty high. Um, so th these are the level of granularity that, uh, that uh, you can get to. Uh, with the open EBS technology because it is um, the entire storage controller policies are at a at a volume level right um, let's let's go to uh, the demo overview here uh, what I have um, is a, a pretty you know a, a typical multi cloud setup where uh, I have uh, you know uh, I would want to run my stateful applications across clouds and there is a need here today for my demo that I want to move uh, a stateful application such as Jenkins from uh, one Kubernetes cluster running in, in Google uh, US Central Zone to probably another uh, Google uh, Kubernetes cluster running in Europe Zone. And uh, potentially, um, if time permits, we can also show that we have an AWS zone that's, that's running um, in, in the US East. So uh, what we're going to actually show first is to run Jenkins and build some software builds on Jenkins in, in the Austin cloud. We named Austin, Denmark, and uh, Mule Master for the three clusters. And uh, after building it, uh, we're going to use CMotion uh, tech review feature and move this Jenkins parts to part to uh, the other zone. And then similarly, uh, run again the build from where we stopped uh, in, in, in Austin cluster. Then we can do the same from uh, Denmark uh, to the other cloud, uh, which, is, which is in AWS, and then back from AWS to uh, the Austin cluster. Um, uh, let me just uh, pull up my other 
laptop here. Okay. Uh, let me show you the Kubernetes clusters where uh, I'm, this is in Google and uh, there are two clusters. Uh, one is named uh, Austin, the other one Denmark Maya. And as you can see, there are two, um, uh, the, the two clusters are in two different zones. And then my Jenkins pod is running in Austin cluster uh, as the last uh, thing shows. And I have an Amazon where I don't have um, any active uh, pods right now. And uh, let me also show a building of uh, Jenkins on on Austin cluster right now. So uh, we're going to. There are already eleven builds built. Build number twelve is probably we're going to build on Austin. So build number twelve is done. Probably let me build one more. Uh, it's pretty fast. We we kept some small. Um, uh, software to be built as a build. So now I'm showing you an active cluster which is running on Google. Now I'm going to use uh, my Jenkins pod moment through CMotion. And what I'm going to do here is uh, use uh, my C uh, command to prepare this in store on, on the destination which is uh, the Denmark cluster, which is in the European zone. Um, what it does is to, to spin up uh, a C-Store pod and then be ready to receive the data. And uh, <clears throat> so the preparation is done, and then we're going to actually move the Jenkins pod from the source Denmark, or sorry, Austin, to the destination Denmark. So uh, what it does is uh, it takes a snapshot of the data and uh, then move, as Jeffrey explained, uh, while explaining C-Store, uh, it gets moved uh, in incremental fashion. And if, while the live data is, is being added to the source, it can still be able to do uh, incremental asynchronous snapshot technology. And we can actually see in Kubernetes uh, that uh, the Jenkins part is, is uh, now uh, being prepared on the destination side, and you will see in a minute or less, uh, the Jenkins goes down on Austin and comes up on uh, Denmark. Um, that's that's the kind of a live moment of uh, the stateful application across clouds. And uh, you'll see some, uh, it's, it's uh, almost done. If I refresh it, uh, you should see it kind of going down. Yes, it's it's done. Uh, now it actually runs as in the last column. You can see uh, it's in Denmark cluster, right? Now we can go back to Jenkins and then um, build it the same build where we left off uh, at Austin cluster. We'll we'll build it on. So now the pod would have gone down here at Austin. Um, then let me try the Denmark. So Jenkins should be up and all the data uh, is moved here and my stateful data should be attached to the Jenkins pod that's running in the target cluster. So the data is intact. And I've done 12, 13 builds there. They are available and I'm uh, going to build probably 14 and 15. Yep. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of a quick demo where we use the C store, C motion feature to move a Jenkins pod live from one Kubernetes cluster to another. Um, the, the backend mechanism which we showed is a, is a, bit primitive right now. Uh, that's why we call this a tech review. Um, as we build C-Store uh, and Moya online, and this will be made uh, very seamless and be integrated into the Kubernetes 
federation feature uh, so that you know as you move your application the storage uh, orchestration for moving across the clouds uh, will be taken care of by my online um, that's that's the demo and uh, we are almost uh, two minutes beyond the stipulated time i can take some time uh, to answer any questions if there are any Open the immediate uh, roadmap. Uh, thank you, Dan. Um, as as we said, that we are um, uh, there are three tracks um, in in the works. Uh, one is uh, open EBS itself to a community. Uh, we talked about 0 0.6 release, where uh, we are um, planning to add more storage policies, and the storage engine is itself is being refactored. Uh, to use the CRD architecture. And the other one is uh, Jeffrey is um, putting together a refactored uh, storage engine called C Store. Um, that's, that's the real user space storage engine, very high performing. Um, and the third one is Maya Online. Maya Online um, will have more features, as I mentioned. It will be, uh, in some form, it will be free uh, for. Uh, many users only when you need to get support on open EBS uh, you may need to move from free model to a commercial model uh, but the um, open EBS team will will try to make parallel progress in all these three areas uh, Jeffrey Evan you want to add something to that um, <clears throat> yeah so uh, um... In, in terms of C store as, as you can imagine it, it is a reasonable uh, amount of work and um, in particular, the, the uh, user space I.O. Uh, involves a significant amount of engineering and, and more so even more testing. So uh, our plan is to incrementally uh, release C store and you know, basic, basically the, the, the fundamentals are already, uh, fundamental pieces are already done. Um, as you can see, the C motion demo is using C store. Uh, it would not be possible. Well, it would be possible, but you know, not as efficient um, without it. Um, and we are, uh, um, we, we still need to go over the exact details on how we are going to incrementally uh, bring and roll this out uh, to the community because uh, C Store itself will also uh, be open source. And um, so you can see C Store evolving over time. So first it will be there, but you know, not not the fastest one. And then you know, incrementally. We will add the IOC container. We will improve performance, improve performance, and add functionality. Um, and obviously, the integration with with the orchestration framework from Maya is is is, is also important. And, and we can't have one without the other. Um, so we're also uh, working hard to get that uh, um, you know out to the community. So I think the best way uh, would be you know to follow us on GitHub and 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 see how we are uh, progressing over time. Yeah, all I would add is, uh, this is Evan, the, the basic idea is to get uh, everything, quote unquote, production ready, um, certainly in the first half of the year, and, and there's some a lot of production workloads on us now, so we acknowledge that, but um, really uh, end, of, end of the first quarter. Um, and we're just going to err on the side of being uncomfortably transparent with, uh, because production ready, uh, obviously mileage may vary. So we want to make sure users have the information in their hands to make you know make those judgments. Um, so yeah, an outward facing development process, and um, yeah, and then the thing that I would say is expect some acceleration um, as we add to the team. Uh, hopefully, we don't spend all of our time interviewing people. <laughs> <laughs> there's a net gain here uh, as, as we keep growing uh, because we are, we are growing uh, and then Maya online gives us some again visibility and uh, as we get more live users on it into how people are using open EBS so we're, we're hopeful that will help us also address bottlenecks and you know add capabilities be, be more intelligent 
Um, but nothing beats an issue opened on GitHub right? or a question on Slack. So, um, so we're going to be as responsive and transparent as possible and use data in the form of data from Maya Online to hopefully help make good decisions. Um, thank you, Evan. Uh, are there any further questions uh, we can answer? Thank you for staying late. I think we are 10 minutes past, but um, yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, this thanks, Uma. Thank, thank, thank you, Uma. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you for attending, and uh, this has been a good session. See you at the next. Uh, Uma, hello Uma. Yeah. Uh, so we have another question from Zayazin, and his question is: Any talk about C motion online? All right. Uh, C motion is a tech preview feature. Uh, we will um, will be happy to show the demo if uh, you want again or uh, any particular presentation. But uh, there is limited documentation available right now on it. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say we'd love to get it in the hands of people if they want to kick the tires a, a bit. Um, but uh, the, there's obvious reasons why we're doing it as a tech preview uh, in this case, um, such as it, it is a new storage engine and uh, some of the things Jeffrey said about, yeah, these are your, your crown jewels, may, may not be the right phrase, but uh, you get the idea. So. Uh, we will get it out in an open source form shortly, which also does require test results. Uh, it requires docs uh, as well. So we are headed there. We're just not quite there yet. Yep. Uh, thank you, Georgian, uh, uh, for your interest in uh, um, emotion. We'll, we'll keep you informed. Uh, please sign up at uh, my online and uh, you'll be in our uh, system and uh, we'll, we'll keep you informed and also on our Slack, please join us and we'd love to answer any further questions there. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.